awesome if you agree with these words that we're singing, that you would just kind of take that extra step and that you would say it from your heart to God, that it would become more than just singing. It would be you worshiping God when you say it. what you've done in our lives you can be seated for just a second we get to experience something great this morning baptism absolutely and I am so um, excited to introduce to you for those who don't know Ingrid this is Ingrid Berkey and it, I know you can give her some love it's good <laughs> Ingrid is wearing a shirt that says a changed life because your life has been changed and Ingrid you are my dear friend it's such an honor to be able to be here with you this morning as you're getting baptized and I know so much of your story, but I was reading something that you wrote on your testimony that people are reading right now, and that you shared that at one point in your life, you were experiencing some despair and some loneliness, and that you felt like God was calling you to Himself. And so when He did that, you found a church home. And then you're standing here today because God has changed your life, and He took you out of that loneliness and out of that despair and into a new place where you feel whole and restored and redeemed. And then you have a huge family sitting right over there who is here to support you today. And the reason I share that is because baptism is a testimony, and there's someone out there in the, in the, in the congregation right now feeling that same thing. And so what you're doing right now is you are saying, hey, if you're feeling that loneliness and despair, you can find what I found today. And that's what's so profound about your testimony. And I love, Ingrid, the verses that you chose. One is from Psalm 40, 2 through 3. And this is, um, I'm going to read this to you. He lifted you, Ingrid, out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set your feet on a rock, and He gave you a firm place to stand. He put a new song in your mouth, a hymn of praise to your God. Many will see and fear Jesus and put their trust in Him. And the other passage that you chose was 2 Corinthians 16 through 18, 3, 16 through 18. And it says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Ingrid, this morning you are a testimony to the Lord's freedom and to His transformation. And it is an honor to baptize you. So I want to ask you a question. Do you trust Jesus? Yes. And will you follow Him all the days of your life? Yes. And is it your desire to be baptized? Yes, it is. Well, based on your profession of faith, it is an honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
something maybe in your life that that is bigger than you and it just causes you it forces you into a place of weakness maybe there's something I know for me that I just can't figure my way out of it it's just bigger than me my own power cannot rescue me from it and then let me just tell you this morning and just give you a little bit of hope from the beginning of time God has used the weak And he has made them strong from the very, very beginning. So the things in your life that are bigger than you, that you cannot handle, that you cannot pull yourself out of, those are the things that God comes in and he says, I got you. That's why it says the weak made strong. In whose love? In the Savior's love. We call him Savior because he saves us. He saved Ingrid. Amen? He saved you. And so... The challenge every Sunday morning is to make that shift out of just singing songs and into worshiping God. So you make it personal to you and say, God, why are you my cornerstone today? I know why God is my cornerstone today. And I ask you that question. What makes you weak? And where in your life is God your cornerstone? Where is he your savior today? And when you say Lord of all savior, man, thank God for it. Okay. All right. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong today in the Savior's love.
And pray with me if you would. Lord, we gather here in our weakness to experience again your strength. And our prayer is that as we gather in your name, Lord, that your presence with us, that it might strengthen us in ways that will help us live for you. And so as we are here in, in worship this morning, Lord, may our hearts be open to that presence, to that strength, to the power of your love to transform us. For we pray that all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. Anybody need to yawn but me? Like it's like, I don't know. Anybody here for the 930 service? Be honest. Any, anybody? Yeah. Uh, our staff uh, are here. Uh, it's daylight savings time, and you made it. You successfully sprang forward. Why don't you greet somebody and congratulate them for springing forward this morning? Let them know you're glad they're here. If you're watching online, we are so glad you get to be part of Mountaintops community that way. Let us know where you're watching the service from, what time zone you're in, and, uh, and just greet each other to our online community. Hey, uh, as you're finding a seat, I just want to say a special welcome to anyone who might be here for the very first time. Wow, it's Daylight Savings Time Sunday and you came to church for the first time. That's pretty impressive uh, in and on itself. I'd have waited to come next week. But uh, at any rate, uh, we are so, so glad you're here. We would love to tell you just more about who we are as a church and some of the things that God has going on here and how you could be a part of that. You can help us to do that. You got a card like this when you came in. And if you fill out the back side of it, you can either put it in an offering bucket in just a little bit, or you can take it by the group's desk, which is right outside these doors. And they have a gift that they'd love to give you and just tell you, uh, more about the church and answer any questions that, that you might have. Uh, let me take a moment and tell you about, we're wrapping up a series this morning. We've been studying the New Testament book of 1 Peter. And next Sunday, we're going to begin a, a short series, just three weeks, and we're going to be looking at some hot topics. Uh, it's a series we did on Wednesday nights last summer, and we felt like some of the topics that we addressed during that series were important enough, and we hear questions about enough that we ought to address them on Sunday morning as well. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about homosexuality, and we're going to talk about abortion, and we're going to talk about the exclusive claim of Jesus Christ being the only way to salvation. And uh, it's going to be a great series. There's going to be a lot of meat in this series. And uh, what we hope to do through it is to equip you uh, to be in conversations with your friends about these topics topics that show up in the news all the time, and not so much share my opinion or anyone else's opinion, but simply to share with you what God's Word says about some of these hot topics that, that we are facing. It's going to be a great series to bring your friends to, and that's why we've created these cards, uh, these invite cards, and you'll see them as you are leaving this morning. Uh, we challenge you, take a stack of these with you, carry them around with you. God will give you opportunities to be able to make those invitations and to use these cards as a way to do that. I also want to say before next, next Sunday's message will be on homosexuality. And anytime I talk about sex in church, I just always kind of want to do a disclaimer for parents that uh, it won't be R-rated, what I'm going to say, but it might be PG-13, uh, because you just can't talk about a topic like human sexuality without uh, dwelling into some very mature issues. And I never like doing that without parents being prepared for that. So there may be some things I say next week that will spawn some conversations in your car as you are going home. And you ought to either be prepared for that or make sure the kids are down in the student center or, or down in children's ministry uh, just for next Sunday's message and, uh, and, and probably for the one on abortion as well. That just, so we just want to give you a heads up to let you know about that. Okay, does everybody know what happens tonight? We've got an auction that is going to take place down in the student center uh, to kind of help launch our, our partnership with Habitat for Humanity and Coretta Williams. We've got construction on a home for Coretta and her three children that'll begin later this month. And uh, we've said this every week, but I just wanted to hit it one more time. Everyone can participate in the way we're going to do the auction tonight. And there'll be some live auction items that we will, uh, or, or some silent auction items that we will bid off, but the live auction is going to be handled kind of differently, and so you will be able to bid and participate and give at every level that you can imagine. And so one of the things that I decided to do, remember about a month ago, I gave you a latte challenge, you know, to, to take 
and, and what I've been doing is taking the five dollars each week that I like to spend on my Vente non-fat extra hot, no water, double, uh, seven pump, uh, extra, uh, dirty chai tea latte. I can't even say it. Uh, and I love them. And I've not had one since December 31st, except the one, yeah, right, uh, thank you, yeah. My wife cheered for that too. Um, they're not good for you. Um, and so I've been putting an extra five bucks in during the services uh, as money I'm saving. And remember, we all give a little bit, it makes a latte difference. It's real good. Uh, I say, I'm going to save it tonight because it, whether you have $5 or $50 or $500, there'll be a chance for you to give that to the auction tonight to help to build that home. And so come tonight if you don't have your tickets yet. And I realized last Sunday when Mary Beth was making the announcement that I didn't have my tickets yet. Um, it's not too late. Harvest still has some tickets that are available. It's going to be a great evening, a lot of fun. We're going to raise money uh, for an incredible project. Starts at 5.30 down in the Student Center. And, uh, and I just hope to see all of you there because we're looking forward to it. Our ushers are going to come forward now, and uh, this is a chance for us to give back to God out uh, of blessings that he's entrusted to us. Uh, just to remind you, 10% of everything that you give, we give away uh, to mission partners off the mountain to can, can support work like this Habitat Home and other work that is going on. The other 90% we use here on the mountain to help tell God's story of his amazing love and the ways that he is changing lives. And so when you give, you are investing in ministry that is making an eternal difference. And so give with thanksgiving and, and give with expectancy at what God is going to do as we continue to invest in his kingdom. our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection.
believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's awesome. Awesome. Let's pray together. Lord, we do believe. Uh, we believe in your name. We believe in the things that you have done for us. We believe, as we've sung earlier, that, that when we are weak, that you can make us strong. Lord, we believe that you'll take these gifts that we return to you and that we give in your name and that you will bless them and multiply them, that you will use them for your glory. You will use them to help build your kingdom and tell your story here on the mountain and off the mountain here in Birmingham and in places all around the world. And Lord, we believe that you have called us to live for you in ways that sometimes will take us out of step with the ways in which the world is living. And when that happens, we need encouragement. And so as we open your word again, as, as we continue the study on 1 Peter, Lord, we pray that you would have our hearts open to words of encouragement and truths that you would teach us that will help us to live for you and for your glory. And we ask all of that in Christ's name and for his glory alone. Amen. Amen. Uh, how many of you ever feel overwhelmed? Anybody, anybody not raise your hand? I was thinking about that's kind of a silly question. Uh, because at some point in our lives, uh, I almost need to sit down when I say this. Uh, at some point in our lives, we all feel overwhelmed. I mean, life's just moving too fast. You ever feel that way? Life's just moving too fast and you can't keep up? Or you've got so much to do and there's just not enough time to do it? Or, or maybe it's a particular task that you need to accomplish and, and you don't have the skills or you feel like you just don't have the resources to get it done? Or sometimes what happens, I've seen this happen a few times this past week, life just throws a curveball out of you just from completely out of the blue and you weren't prepared for it and then they delay schools for two hours and that just messes, you know, everything up completely. I mean, life can be overwhelming. I mean, I'll just be honest with you, this, this past week has been in kind of an overwhelming week for me and, and I've kind of found myself feeling all of this uh, over the course of the past week. But, but years ago, I discovered a secret for surviving when life feels overwhelming. And what I want to do is to share what I've learned with you this morning, if you want to hear it. And uh, Billy does, so we'll do it. Um, and... Uh, and Sandy. Uh, here's the secret. When life feels overwhelming, follow the leader. Amen. Say that with me. Follow the leader. Y'all remember playing follow the leader when you were a kid, you know, a kid's game? And, and what you do, you pick one kid, one kid gets chosen to be the leader, and you put them at the front of the line, and then all the other kids line up behind them, and the leader will kind of take you on a little journey around, and everyone who follows the leader has to do what the leader does. So if the leader, you know, hops on one foot, everyone behind has to hop on one foot. If the leader gets down and crawl, I'm just doing that to mess up the cameras. Um, <laughs> The leader gets down and crawl. Everybody has to get down and crawl. If the leader does a handstand into a round off off the front of the stage, yeah, yeah that's not going to happen. Uh, and so if you follow the leader successfully, uh, you, you win. I mean, if you fail to do what the leader does, if you don't follow the leader, you know, well, you, you have to drop out of the game. Those who follow the leader successfully keep doing what the leader does. They win. 
Now, now here's what I've discovered. When, when life is overwhelming, if you follow the leader, you'll win in the sense that you will overcome whatever it is that has you overwhelmed. But you have to pick the right leader. If you pick the wrong leader, what, what happens is you, you just wind up deeper into the mess that has you overwhelmed in the first place. But if you follow the right leader, you'll overcome those things that overwhelm you and, and it will lead you to a better life. And I'm convinced Peter understands that. Uh, for the last month, we have been studying a letter written by one of Jesus' disciples, a guy by the name of Peter. And Peter was just an ordinary guy who left everything to follow Jesus. And he discovered that, that when you do that, uh, you find a better way to live, you find a way to live forever. But what also happens is that when you begin to follow Jesus, you get out of step with the rest of the world. And, and sometimes it'll make you feel like an outsider. And sometimes it'll make you feel like you don't belong. And, and Peter understood that everyone who makes this decision to follow Jesus is going to start to feel like at times like they don't fit in to the communities where they used to belong. And so Peter wants to write this letter uh, to encourage them. To, to give them some, some practical wisdom for how to live when you feel like what Peter would describe as a chosen exile. Now, here's just kind of a quick review of what we've learned so far. Uh, Peter says that when you feel like you're an outsider from the rest of the world, when you feel like you don't fit in, remember that your true identity is found in Jesus Christ. And, and no matter what the world may tell you about, about who you are, who you really are is a part of God's chosen people and a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and that you are God's special treasured possession. That's your true identity. And Peter knows that, that when we find ourselves out of step with the rest of the world, because we don't gossip the way the world gossips, and, and we don't go to the same kind of movies that the world goes to or listen to the same music or tell the same sort of jokes, and pe Peter knows that people are going to think you're weird because of that. And, and they're going to think you're strange. And sometimes they're going to make fun of you. And, and you might be mocked and you might be ridiculed. You might even be insulted. Peter told us, we saw this last week, he said, don't be surprised when that happens. But, but here's the deal. It's actually this great opportunity for you to give a reason, to give an explanation for this living hope inside of you, for the reason that you live out of step with the rest of the world. So Peter says, don't be surprised when people insult you. They insulted Jesus. Instead, continue to do good. And, and you see this throughout this letter. This is Peter's overall overarching strategy for how to live as a chosen exile. Continue to do good. In fact, we've looked at this verse every week in the series, but it's so important, so, so much at the heart of this letter. I'll look at it just one last time. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans. And we really shouldn't read pagans there because we tend to read pagans with kind of a snarl, pagans. Uh, that, that's not the way Peter intended this. Read it like this. Live such good lives among your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers and your classmates and even your family. Live such good lives among everyone around you that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds and they'll just have to admit that it's a better way. And they'll glorify God on the day that he visits us. Peter's strategy is that when we live as a follower of Jesus Christ in a world that we don't fit in, that we never become resentful of the world. We never blame the world for our problems. We don't walk around criticizing culture for how non-Christian it's become, because it never really was. Instead, we just live good lives reflecting the life that Jesus Christ gave for us and to us. And, and, and this is Peter's strategy. Uh, when you feel overwhelmed, 
And, and, and sometimes just being out of step with the world is why you'll feel overwhelmed. When you feel overwhelmed, Peter would say, follow the leader. Uh, in fact, look, look in chapter 2. If, if you have First Peter open, look in chapter 2, verse 21. Peter says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should do what? Follow. That you should follow in his steps. That you should follow in his steps. Here's how you live in the world as a chosen exile. Follow the example that Jesus set for you. Peter goes on, here's the example. Jesus committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. So when they hurled insults at you, don't retaliate. When he suffered, he makes no threats. When you suffer for his sake, you don't, don't make threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And then this last part, just the heart of the gospel. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. Peter says, Jesus gives us this example to, to how we live, how, how we follow, how we, how we suffer, how we bear up when people make fun of us and people think we're weird and people insult us. Jesus gives us an example. What we need to do is to follow in his steps. We just need to follow the leader. And, and Peter might have put it this way. It's an image that you find in this letter. What he might have said was follow the shepherd. Follow the shepherd. Look at chapter 5. We're getting to the end of the letter, so I want to make sure we get into chapter 5. Uh, verse 2. Uh, he starts with some instructions for those of us who lead churches. He says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. I have a friend who uh, pastors a church that's filled with problem sheep, and, uh, and he, I love, he, loves, he always says this. He goes, yeah, Jesus loves them, and I'm trying. And uh, I've never pastored a church like that, thank goodness. Uh, he says, not because you must, because you're willing. Uh, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to us, but being examples to the flock. That's us. We're the flock. We're the sheep. He says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You notice how he refers to Jesus? He's the chief shepherd. And, and it's an idea that he introduced earlier in his letter, uh, if you're flipping back and forth, in, in chapter 2, verse 25, he says, you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Hey, y'all know how sheep go astray? Now, sheep are not the, uh, the brightest animals uh, in the animal kingdom. They're kind of like one fry short of a happy meal. And um, here's what happens for sheep. Sheep will not run away. That's just not in their, their DNA. Sheep will never run away. What, here's what happens for a sheep. You know, a, a sheep is kind of sitting here, and he, he's munching on a, a clump of grass, and he's thinking, man, it's really good grass. That's the way sheep talk. I didn't know if you knew that. And he's saying, man, it's really, really good grass. And, uh, and then he, he kind of, out of the corner of his eye, sees another clump of grass over here, and he thinks, well, hey, that grass looks good, too. And uh, not too bad. And uh, get it bad. <laughs> sheep are so corny. Um, and so he wanders over, and, and uh, this grass starts munching around. Hey, pretty good grass. Hey, I like this. Hey, there's some more. Not too bad. And, uh, and, and he wanders over this little clump of grass. And, uh, and, and he just keeps doing this and, and doing this. And then he kind of reaches a moment, gets over here, and kind of looks up and goes, hey, where did everybody go? <laughs> and, and he's lost. Uh, sheep don't run away. Sheep get distracted and wander away. Like That's how they go astray. And, and, and that's what we do. Most of us don't run away. Most of us just wander away. And so what sheep need uh, are shepherds. Sheep need shepherds. And Jesus uh, would refer to himself as, as the shepherd that we need. And Peter heard that. You don't want to forget this. When, when you're reading this letter, uh, it, sometimes it's easy to forget that Peter was one of the first, remember one of the first disciples that Jesus called. Peter had this front row seat for three years to everything that Jesus taught, for, for, to, to witness everything that Jesus did. Peter was right there when, when there's a miraculous catch of fish out of Peter's own boat. P Peter is right there when, when Jesus would turn water into wine and, and he would feed the crowds. 
and heal the sick and even raise the dead. Uh, Peter experienced that kind of power himself when uh, he, he had the courage to step out of a boat and to join Jesus in walking on water. P- Peter was right there. He had a firsthand view of, of everything that, that Jesus did. Uh, Peter would have remembered what Jesus taught. He remembered how, this is out of Matthew 9, he remembered how Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Peter saw all that. And he remembers that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like what? Like sheep without a shepherd. And Peter remembers Jesus saying that he'd be that sheep, that shepherd for the sheep. Uh, From John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A few verses later, he adds, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And Peter certainly remembers the last words that Jesus spoke directly to him. You don't forget conversations like that. Uh, If you know Peter's story, you know there was a moment that, uh, that Peter gave in to the, the pressures of the world. Uh, and, and that's why I think he can write this letter so well to us, to, to encourage us when we are tempted to do the same. Because there's a moment in his life when Peter gave in to the pressures of the world and his fears about what the world might do to him, and he denied even knowing Jesus. Uh, and then uh, a little bit later, uh, after his resurrection, Jesus comes to forgive Peter for, for his denial. And he pulls him aside and, and he gives Peter an opportunity to, to reaffirm the love he had for his Lord. And, and then he gives him these instructions. This is at the very end of uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, Peter says, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And so Jesus tells him, here's what I want you to do, Peter. I want you to feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Because sheep go astray, and sheep get lost, and sheep get hungry, and sheep need a shepherd. And and I'm convinced that Peter has all that in mind as he's writing this this amazing letter of of encouragement to the church, and, and encouragement for you and for me. This idea that Jesus, he's the shepherd, the overseer of our souls. He's the chief shepherd. He's the one who who watches over us. And it's easy to imagine that that Peter also had a a backdrop in his mind, the images that you find throughout the the Bible, especially the Old Testament, of God being our shepherd. Remember, we looked at this kind of in detail a few weeks ago. Peter loved to take Old Testament images and incorporate them into this letter. And I'm convinced he's doing that here. And he's got this Old Testament image of God as our shepherd, as the backdrop for for what he is saying. And and you see that image uh, most clearly, maybe most clearly, uh, in a a very, very familiar psalm, uh, Psalm 23. And uh, if you've been in church forever, you probably had to memorize that as you were a kid. If this is your first time in church, you've heard portions of this psalm read. It's just kind of become that familiar in our culture. And, and I thought it'd be worthwhile for us just to kind of quickly walk through it and unpack it. So if you want to, Psalms are kind of right in the middle of the Bible. If you want to follow along with me, uh, just the real familiar words of Psalm 23 it begins this way. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Read that loud with me. It's up on the screens as well. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now, if you grew up memorizing it, if you kind of hear it out in culture, usually we use the King James Version at this point. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall, I don't even need to read it. Y'all can just say it. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is an incredibly bold statement when you think about it. How many of you have ever had occasion to to say, "I, I, I just don't have enough. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money, I don't have enough help. Whatever it is, you just feel like, I just don't have enough. You ever feel that way? The psalmist says, if the Lord is your shepherd, that's not true. If you're following the shepherd, here's the truth, you actually have enough money and time and help. If the Lord's your shepherd, you don't want, you've got everything that you need. And so when you feel overwhelmed, if you follow the shepherd, 
and, and you discover you actually have everything that you, you need. Uh, verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Uh, I love that he makes me lie down. Anybody ever tried to put an overtired three-year-old down for a nap? He done that? And they don't want to go? And in your mind, you're thinking, okay, is, can I strap kids to the bed? Is that legal? Is there, you know, an is- issue with this? Because um, sometimes when you're, you're exhausted and you're over, overwhelmed, you, you have to be made to rest. And, and the, the psalm says, the Lord, will, he'll make you rest. And, uh, and quiet waters, uh, kind of the King James Version, still, still waters. Some of y'all know this. You know the deal with sheep? Sheep won't drink out of running water because they're stupid animals. And, uh, and we get, that's us. I, I think it's kind of insulting, Lord. Um, but they, they won't. And, and so the shepherd has to take them to quiet, still water because that's the only thing they'll drink out of. So if, if you feel overwhelmed, you follow the shepherd. And, and you find rest and, and refreshment for your soul. Verse 3. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Uh, sometimes we get overwhelmed because of the decision that we're facing, and we, we can't decide what we're supposed to do. Or sometimes, and, and this is often true, we know exactly what we're supposed to do. We just don't want to do it. Because option B actually looks kind of fun and has at least some short-term re- rewards and happiness that, that kind of comes with it. And, and, and we're trying real hard to, to follow uh, the, and, and live a better life, but, but sometimes we just need guidance. Follow the shepherd, you get that sort of guidance. And, and when you feel overwhelmed by decisions, he'll keep your feet on the right path. Verse 4, uh, even though I walk through the darkest valley, King James Version, you know this, even though I walk through the valley shadow of death, uh, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Uh, this past week, that's a, that's a tough week for some of the families here at Mountaintop. Uh, they, they walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And uh, in, in some of the cases, a completely unexpected uh, journey this past week. Uh, what I saw in, in every case, and, and honestly, it's kind of beautiful to, to watch it take place, is how they experience the comfort of the shepherd even in the darkest valleys. And, and that can be true for everybody if you follow the shepherd. When you face a crisis and it feels like it's just going to overwhelm you and, and, uh, and the valley's too deep and the darkness is just too dark, you follow the shepherd, you'll find comfort and peace even in the midst of that crisis. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Sometimes when, when you're overwhelmed, uh, it feels like the world is against you. And, and you tell your friends, you know, I, I just don't watch movies like that. No, I, I just, I, I'm just not comfortable going to that kind of party. And you tell them that and people start to insult you and they kind of mock you and make fun of you. And you feel like it's you against the world. But when you follow the shepherd, you find that even in the presence of your enemies, that you're not alone and that you are provided for. That the shepherd will provide all your need. Verse 5 continues, uh, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to do the right things, you just need somebody to say, you're doing, you're doing a good job. Attaboy. Uh, ju- you just need a little bit of affirmation. That's, that's the image here, this anointing. It's this image of, of, of God saying, listen, you're, you're doing well, and I just want to recognize that, and, and I'm, I'm so proud of you. And, and you don't need to worry about anyone else approving of what you do. God says, I approve. And, and that's the, the, the approval of the shepherd is the only approval you really need. And then finally, verse 6 says, Surely your goodness and love, your goodness and mercy, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When, when you feel like an outsider, Peter says, that you start to follow God, you, get, you follow Jesus, you're going to feel like an outsider. But here's the truth, you really belong. You, you belong in the house of the shepherd where, where you will be surrounded by, by his love and his goodness and his mercy today and forever. And so when life feels overwhelming, here's the secret. Follow the shepherd. You, you just need to make a decision 
to follow the shepherd. Now, I've said this throughout the series, but I need to say it again. Uh, when you make that decision, it will take you out of step with the rest of the world. And you won't fit in. And it, it doesn't mean it gives you permission to blame the world or to be critical of culture. Uh, what it means is that when, and when that happens, that your challenge is just to do good, to, to live as, as best you can following the shepherd as a witness to the rest of the world of what a better life really looks like. And, and if, if you want a life with, without want in which you, you never lack for anything, if, if you want to have comfort in the dark valleys, if you want to have your steps guided, if you want to dwell in, in the presence of God's goodness and mercy forever, what, what you have to do is follow the shepherd even when it takes you out of step with the rest of the world. And I'll confess, it's not easy to do. The thing that mostly gets in our way is our pride. We want people to think well of us. We, we hate it when people insult us, make fun of us. And, and our pride gets in the way. I've been reminded this week, I don't tend to think of myself as a very prideful person, um, but I've had a couple of instances this week just kind of reminded me of how prideful I can be at times. And, and following the shepherd uh, requires a certain amount of humility. And so Peter wraps up this amazing letter like this. This is uh, chapter five, down in verse six. He says, humble yourselves. You have to let go of your pride. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Anybody anxious this morning about anything? Follow the shepherd. You cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Uh, a very familiar verse. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Remember, though, shepherds protect the sheep from lions. And that's why you can resist them and stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. When you decide to be an outsider, an exile, get out of step with the world, here's the thing, you don't do it alone. There are a bunch of other weird outsiders who are gonna do it with you. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. The God of all grace will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. That is a great letter. So here's my challenge to you. And, and, and we've said this every week. Tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and you're going to go to school. No delays tomorrow. Weather's going to be perfect, you know. Who know? Well, I don't know. If it rains, we'll cancel school. That seems to be the par for the course. Um, tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and you're going to go to school or you're going to go to work or you're going to be with your friends and what, whatever it's going to look like. Uh, you get to make a decision. Are, are you going to be in step with the world or are you going to be out of step with the world, but in step with Jesus? You get to decide who you want to follow. Now, one of the ways that, that you can follow the, the, the world's way, you know, it, it'll be okay. And people will like you. And, and you'll feel included and, and you'll feel like you belong. But, but I want to be really honest with you right now. It's a dead end. And, and it, it won't lead to life. The other way, when, when you follow the shepherd, it'll feel like you don't fit in at first. And, and people around you, they'll make fun of you and they'll mock you and they'll, they'll ridicule you. But it is the only way to experience life that lasts forever. And you'll discover it leads to a better life today if you'll just follow the shepherd. So we're going to close the series the, the same way that, that we began it with an invitation to be in exile, an invitation to step outside and to join the rest of us on the outside, discovering this better life in Christ.
Uh, I'm going to pray in a moment. The band's going to come back out. And, uh, and we're going to do kind of a fun song. We're, y'all know the song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus? We're going to do that. I'm told, what, what's it? It's a boom chuck or something like that. You have to clap to it to make the song work. So if you have rhythm, clap. If you don't, watch someone seated near you who has rhythm and mimic. Um, follow their example as, as you do that. But, but more importantly, here's what I want you to do. Wherever you might be on your faith journey, I want you to use this song as an opportunity to make a declaration that I'm a father shepherd. I'm a father shepherd. Maybe you've been following him for a long time, but it's easy to get astray, like because sheep tend to do that. And, and you get off track. And so we sing this song, and it's just going to be your declaration. I'm going to get back in line. I'm going to keep following the shepherd. I'm going to stay in line. I'm going to follow the shepherd. Uh, maybe you followed him well in the past, and, and lately you've just kind of really, there's a clump of grass way over here. Man, it looks so good. And, and you've been munching on it for a while. Days to day, it's time to come back. And, and let the words of this song be, be just your declaration. I have decided that I'm going to follow the shepherd. And maybe, maybe you need to make that decision for the very first time. There's no magic about that. It's simply letting go of your pride and admitting that I I can't do this all by myself and saying, Lord Jesus, I've decided that I want to follow you and and see if this way of life really is a better way and, and take hold of a life that is truly life. Let's pray together. Lord, wherever we are in the room right now, some of us, uh, we're a little off track and we just need to get back on the path. Some of us kind of took a pretty good detour and, uh, and we need to bring, bring us back. And, and th- maybe there's somebody in the room this morning that today is the day that they need to step out in faith and, and simply say, Jesus, I'm ready for you to be my shepherd. And I want to follow you. Lord, I pray that as we sing this song, it won't just be a fun song that we'll sing, but it'll be a declaration of our hearts that we have decided to follow you into the better life that you hold out for all of us. A life with you that lasts forever. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand and we're going to sing. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back.
How do you do that? I kind of want to get Andrew to do my voicemail. Hello. <laughs> hey, uh, r- real seriously, uh, if today is the day, that even, even as we were singing that and having fun singing that, if today is the day that you want to take a step of faith and follow the shepherd and, and no turn back. Uh, uh, don't turn back. I'll be down front right after the service. Come and tell me that. And, and let me help point you and uh, what the next steps should look like and, and to pray with you and to have a chance to do that. And if today's the day that you just simply need prayer, uh, remind you that we've got a prayer team. They'll be over here in our new prayer room, uh, just, just right off this way. You'll, you'll see it real clearly. And, uh, and they'd love to pray with you and, and lift you up this morning. And for all of you, remember that tomorrow as we head out back to those places, live, work, play, go to school, uh, when we follow the shepherd, uh, we don't have to go to those places alone that he promises to go with us. And our prayer each week is that our living Lord Jesus Christ, that he'd go with you, that he'd go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you his way, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. Hey, if you're part of Mount Top Online this morning, I hope you love that song. I hope you're tapping your feet and clapping at home. I hope you'll join us next week as we start this Hot Topic series. Use social media, invite your friends. Uh, it's going to be a great, great series. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a blessed week.